So it is my pleasure to introduce our last speaker, uh, Tal Rebin, the head of uh, uh, research at Algorand Foundation, right? Um, there you go. Uh, before, joining, before joining Algorand, uh, Tal was a distinguished research staff member and the manager uh, of the legendary cryptographic research group at IBM, uh, TJ Watson. And um, Tal research uh, is focuses on the general area of uh, cryptography and more specifically on distributed cryptographic protocols. And she recently received the RSA uh, award for research. And uh, she will tell us about uh, an old subject with the new applications, right? Uh, threshold cryptography. Yes. Um, so first of all, it's weird to be under the title of algorithm <laughs> for foundation. All my life I was IBM research. That was my first and only job until two months ago, but it's exciting times. Um, you can come later and ask me about Algorand Foundation if you're interested. Uh, it's a blockchain company, cryptocurrency. But now I'm still going to be talking about Threshold Crypto. I was invited to give that talk when I was still at IBM, and this is a topic I want to talk about. Um, it's near and dear to my heart. As Benny said, these things that we did research on uh, many, many years ago are suddenly all becoming very relevant. And um, it's exciting to see these things um, become a reality in some sense. OK. So I'm going to start um, telling you about what are threshold, um, what's threshold crypto, but I'm going to start by talking about things that you know, which we have in our, our physical lives, and their transformation to the digital world. So first of all, we have signatures. Basically, this is a form I took off the web about some father signing that his child can go on a field trip. So we had a piece of paper, and we draw with our hand our signature. In fact, these signatures uh, really cannot be verified in any meaningful way, not by the teacher or anything, I can tell you, because my young child's been fa forging my signature since she was in third grade. So clearly, it uh, really has no impact whatsoever. Um, but you know, so this is a signature. We know what it means. And um, there are some documents when many people sign. So uh, we see this thing, the Declaration of Independence, and of course the big Jan, uh, John Hancock in the center, but all the other um, signatures around it. This meant that everybody ratified the document that was signed, not just only one person. OK. Then we have another thing in our life, which is telling secrets. Um, we all know what that means, and we know that thing when you lean over and you try to say something very quietly and privately. Of course, your friend never keeps your secret, but never mind. But we still think in some way that it's secret. And then I want to describe what it would mean to tell a group a secret. So look at this situation. Um, the woman on the left, she has a secret. And she meets with her first friend on the first row. And she tells her on a date. She said just that portion of the sentence, on a date. So this friend doesn't know anything. What on a date? Did somebody go on a date? Who went on the date? With whom did they go on the date? She knows nothing. Then she meets her, her second friend and she said, I went. But also, the second friend by herself doesn't know anything. You went where? What did you do? Did you go to the pool? Did you go to a restaurant? Nothing is known. And then she meets her third friend and she says, with John, OK? This friend doesn't know anything either. What did she do with John? What does this mean? But if these three friends get together, then they can uh, recover the secret, which is, I went on a date with John. So they together um, can extract the data of this secret. But they cannot do it until they meet. Um, and until that time, of course, I gave you an example with words. So of course, there's some leakage of information. But we will later show that this can be done without leaking any information. Okay. So when we move to the digital world, we want to um, simulate these um, types, of, types of things that we have in the physical world. In some cases, maybe we don't, maybe it's not important. But in some cases, we do. And um, signatures and secrets are definitely things that we want and need. 
So the digital signatures naturally move to, uh, sorry, the signatures naturally move to what's called the digital signature. And in order to preserve secrets, we use encryption. And the way that these things are done, um, there are various ways, but I'm going to talk about a specific one, is in a public key setting, there are, the, there are two keys associated with these operations. So for the digital signatures, you have a signing key, which is private, and you keep locally. And there's a verification key where, for example, the teacher getting the note from the parent can actually verify um, the signature in a much more meaningful way than we can actually do in the physical world. And for encryption, the things are reversed. There is an encryption key when somebody wants to send me a message privately, they use this key, which is public, and they compute something using this key. And then I have a decryption key, which is private, and once I get the encrypted message, I can decrypt it and learn the secret information which the person wanted to send me. So these, in fact, are two symmetric things. I mean, they're interchangeable in, our, in, our, in the computational sense. But I split it here to give the different mean, oops, I split it here to give the different meaning of what everything means, the signing key and the verification key versus the encryption key and the decryption key. OK. So we move to the digital world. And this is, again, a one-on-one -on -one thing, the same way that only the parent signed. Um, there was one signature on the form. And the way that the little boy was telling the girl the secret, it's always just between two people and not more. So what about this multiple signature thing that we saw with the John Hancock and everybody signing the Declaration of Independence? Are we really interested in these things um, also in the digital world? And the answer is that very, and in fact, in many ways, much more so. So I'll give you an example for signatures. And uh, this is really the things that suddenly drive the interest in these theoretical results, which we generated in the 90s, that were extremely exciting and interesting, but more on a um, philosophical research type level, now they're becoming extremely important. So um, cryptocurrencies are definitely driving an interest in threshold crypto now, specifically in, in threshold signatures. So what would this mean in the digital world? I have my own crypto wallet. And by the way, this is our uh, coin. It's called an algo. This is, of course, a Bitcoin and an Ethereum. But I changed the photo to include the algo, um, which was issued uh, last week on Wednesday. Um, and um, people who actually have these uh, crypto wallets um, face a big problem of how do they keep their wallets secure. Um, the vault industry in the US, the actual physical vaults and banks, is having a, a huge uh, um, popularity thing because everybody comes and, ha and puts their keys, their wallet keys, inside the vaults because some of these wallet keys, of course, are worth, worth a lot of money. So, but you need this key in order to spend the money. So if you're keeping uh, the key in the vault every time you want to buy a piece of gum on the internet, it doesn't really make sense. So you want to enhance the security of your keys. So if you have only one key, then you need to sign with your private signing key. But let's assume that you do something else for extra security. You create three keys that all are eligible, uh, all are signing keys. And you say, whenever I generate a signature with two of my keys, I can purchase um, a refrigerator on the internet and so on. So this um, really provides protection to the keys. Why? First of all, it increases availability. You have the three keys, and now you can go to any two locations and you can keep them online. And because it increases the security, you really don't need to keep it in the vault. Now, in order for somebody to come and spend the money from your wallet, they have to attack two of the servers where you kept your key. 
you have uh, SK1, SK2, and SK3. And now I said, you need two signatures. So now somebody has to attack two computers. So this really increases the security of your wallet in a meaningful way. And you can also have this availability because now you need only two and you can keep them online and it enables you to, um, to have more uh, access to your keys. And the interesting thing in how we design these threshold uh, things, uh, these systems is that you never put a full set of keys in one place. So it's never that that original computer where I generated the keys, this computer can be attacked and the keys can be learned. That does not happen because I'll generate the keys in each computer individually. So this will guarantee the security of the system in a more profound way. Okay. But there is a drawback to the system as I described it here. Um, what did I say? I said that you need um, two signatures in order um, to verify a sale. So this means that somebody first has to store, instead before they stored one string for the signature, now they have to store two uh, strings of the same length. So this doubles the memory. Um, and um, these cryptocurrencies really are already very, very heavy memory-wise, so doubling the space is not a good thing. And furthermore, now for the verification, you also need to do two computations. Before, if it was only one signature, you had to do one verification when you wanted to make sure that the person was allowed to use these coins. And now the computation time has gone up as well, doubled. So the question is, can we find a solution that would prov provide the above desired properties of increasing availability and improving security while not um, uh, having these drawbacks of the increased um, space and um, computation? So this is where threshold crypto comes into play. What I had described before is really also in some sense, threshold crypto. But threshold crypto comes to address also these issues of efficiency and somewhat to try and keep the system transparent in the sense that I don't want to know if I'm a person receiving a signature, whether it was generated by one key or by two keys. We want it to be transparent and still maintain the setting of it being one signature. But we want the signature to have to be generated somehow by more parties. So this is the only slide that's going to have math on it. So you bear with me for this slide, and then we will continue without it. So this is not really a signature scheme, but it gives the flavor of what happens in the signature schemes. We have a secret key, SK, and there's a message, M, which needs to be signed with the secret key. And we define the signature to be m raised to the exponent of sk. If you don't know what it is, it doesn't matter. Um, but what I want to say is that when you see a signature, it's something that's hard to forge. It's not that if you see the signature, you can extract the secret key. So this provides the, the sec this hardness assumption provides the security of the system. And what we do is, as I said, we will take and we will split this secret key into three parts, S1, S2, SK, uh, SK2, and SK3, and they simply sum up to SK, really, just as integers. And now, when we want to generate um, a partial signature, PI will simply compute M to the SKI and publish this information. And then mathematically what happens is that if you multiply these three elements, you get m to the sum at the exponent, which is exactly m to the sk. This is how the math works. So now we see that we generated a full signature, but a single signature, but we needed three people in order to generate it. And um, this is highly efficient, though this really isn't a signature scheme. It does correlate to what we do in, in 
um, signature schemes, which are discrete log based. And um, a, this is an example that you need all three pieces, but you can also change it into the example where I said that any two suffice. You can still generate the signature. Okay, and, um, and as I said, this threshold crypto in general solves this tension that we have between secrecy and availability. We manage to deliver the best of both worlds. And we can do it efficiently and preserve the fact that it's a single signature. Okay, um, let me give another example where we, wanna do, we may want to use threshold crypto. Um, we want to do elections and we want to encrypt the votes and send them um, to some uh, center that will tally the votes. But what um, you can't encrypt under the center's key because if I send my vote encrypted under the center's key, the people there, the person who's the center can simply decrypt my message and see exactly how I voted, something that we don't want to have happen. We want the votes um, to be secret. And um, what do we do? So we'll do again this two thing, uh, the splitting into two keys. We'll have two encryption keys. One encryption key one, of let's say one center and the second encryption key of a second center. And the voter chooses just a random number R and if the voter wants to vote zero, let's say the vote is only zero one, he'll encrypt R under, K, under the key, the first key and will encrypt minus R under the second key. So the sum of these two numbers is zero. And the under, on the other hand, if the voter wants to encrypt one, he'll encrypt R plus one under the first key and minus R under the second key. So the sum of this is one. And this is again like that example with uh, the woman and her friends. She gave everybody a little bit of information, but just the part of the information does not reveal anything. So first of all, you can see that the second party anyway always gets minus R. But the first party doesn't know if this is the value R or the value R plus 1 because the voter could have chosen R plus 1 as their value. So the first entity doesn't learn anything about the vote either. So separately, if these two entities are separated and do not communicate, then separately they don't have any information of what the voter um, chose, whether they chose a 0 or a 1. And then in the next step, the owner of the key um, EKI, the first one and the second one, they sum the votes and they decrypt the tally. So each one just has a random sum of all the values that they received. And then if you take these two values and you sum tally one plus tally two, you get exactly the result of the elections, right? Because every R um, that was a zero vote will be canceled by, by the minus R vote. And any vote of an R has an R plus one will, minus R will leave a one. So you'll get, let's say, 10 people voted one. You'll get a sum of 10. And this exactly gives you this um, uh, total computation. So you see again how the distribution, sort of this threshold uh, encryption and decryption, uh, sorry, the encryption is not threshold, the decryption, the threshold decryption really provided us privacy in the computation. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? Okay. Okay. So now I want to give another um, example for um, how we use uh, threshold encryption. And this is, in fact, the system that we built. And uh, we used it um, to provide um, a tool for um, women or men who want to complain about um, sexual um, harassment, abuse, whatever um, they feel they want to. 
And what we see is that many people are afraid to come forward and to complain about someone because they think that they'll be on their own and they want, don't want to do it when they're only one person. But if they find out that there may be other people who have complained about against the same person, they'll feel more confident um, to step up. So this is, in fact, the system that we built. And again, it uses this um, threshold encryption. And what it does is it, uh, the person who wants to complain encrypts their value under some key where the decryption key is distributed. So no one entity can learn what they encrypted. Same thing as in the vote. Nobody can decrypt my vote and know what it was. And the system on top of it has additional features, which are, are also um, related um, to multi-party computations, the same thing that Benny was talking about. And what it enables the system as a whole is to verify whether there are three complaints against the same person. It seems a little bit amazing, same way as in Benny's computation, that you can suddenly identify relatives. So here it's somewhat the same. We're identifying um, two people or three people who complained against the, the same person. And the minute that there are three complaints in the system against the same, the same perpetrator, then the system does this um, uh, threshold decryption and notifies the three women, the three of you both have, comp or three men, um, you all have complained against person A. So um, again, using threshold decryption, we are able um, to preserve the privacy of the inputs of the people until a later time when we want to um, pass them, do a decryption and reveal the information to um, uh, the, the people who complained in this case. So basically, what it enables us is to preserve information secret until a later point where you want to take action but the information is already stored in the system. And um, just to show how um, uh, these things now are starting to have impact, even NIST, which is the standardization body of the US, um, is now calling for um, standardization of threshold and proactive security. I didn't say what proactive security is, but um, they feel that these are things that are uh, becoming much more popular and relevant um, in our uh, society, and they uh, want to advance the standardization of these things so that we have a uniform platform that we all will work with. Um, so in response to this, um, we have uh, also um, uh, created um, uh, an implementation of our own. This was still done when I was at IBM and was done with um, Hugo Kravchik, who's from IBM, and another person, Jason Resch, from IBM, and Christian Cashin from IBM, and surprisingly, all of us have left IBM since we started the project. So, um, and what's interesting in these things is that um, um, there's a process of moving from the theory to the practice, and it's not um, completely straightforward. And when you actually go and build and design these systems, um, you see that there are a lot of details which we completely ignore in the, our theoretical uh, papers, but that are needed um, in order to actually um, provide um, a system. Um, just to touch upon one point, all our papers, uh, which we did in the 90s, all assumed a synchronous network which of course is not a reality when you're actually going to build a network, a system that works because no system is synchronous. So you have to adapt to these things and introduce um, uh, asynchronicity and then it has, you have to change the protocols and so on. So it's been very interesting um, building this system and uh, Jason Resch, who I uh, mentioned, also implemented everything. So there's also um, the GitHub place where you can see that. And uh, this is just uh, an overview of the system. I won't go into the details. So basically, um, 
I want to summarize regarding threshold crypto. The need is definitely on the rise. I would say that uh, cryptocurrencies are um, uh, maybe the biggest force driving it forward, but there are a lot of things, um, implementations like Benny was talking about, are things that are going to be needed because the privacy regulations that are moving into place are um, very heavy and are being enforced, especially in medical applications. Uh, Europe came out with a very um, strong uh, privacy requirement. Um, the US has its HIPAA rules. Um, and if we simply give up and say, OK, we'll keep everything private, we'll, we'll lose the utilization that we can have from the data, which is very important for scientific reasons and uh, for scientific research and so on. So we definitely want to bridge um, between the fact that we have to provide privacy and want to uh, achieve utilization of data. And uh, these techniques of threshold crypto and multi-party computations are the ones that are going to be driving it and enabling it. So um, not just cryptocurrencies, which of course excite many people need it, but really um, very serious things like enabling medical research. And as I said, um, standardization efforts are starting and also uh, really practical solutions trying to get things that will run in actuality and will be able to do the computations in a reasonable time um, and I think that practical solutions have started, like the SCAPI um, uh, library that uh, Benny mentioned. But still, there needs to be yet another jump to make things run in uh, real time that would work um, in practice. And um, just uh, a little plug for my new company. Um, we're having a meetup today at uh, 6 p.m at um, uh, Urban Place, which is um, on 9 Chada Am Street in Tel Aviv. Um, if you want to come and hear about our um, blockchain and possibly get involved in our community, then we welcome everybody to come. Uh, it's going to start at 6, I think, till 6.30 is sort of an intro. And then there's going to be um, two presentations. So thank you very much.